I am a second generation Maryland American, <laughs> and I am Charles Geschechter. <laughs> I want to uh, make some remarks uh, concerning a report that the California Association of Scholars did in conjunction with the National Association of Scholars. Uh, my main collaborator was John Ellis, so I speak on his behalf as well, but my remarks are my own, and I acknowledge thanks to uh, Peter Wood and Steve Balsh for their help in producing this report. The first half of my talk concerns our 2012 report on classroom politicization at the University of California and its recommendations to the Board of Regents. The second half summarizes the surreal and evasive letters we've received in response to our report over the past 10 months from UC President Mark Udoff and the chair of the Board of Regents, Sherry Lansing. I will conclude by recounting my surprise encounter with President Udoff at a press conference last year that produced a spontaneous and revealing admission from him. But back to Ms. Lansing. She was the CEO of Paramount Pictures from 1992 to 2004 and was long considered the most powerful woman in Hollywood, overseeing mega hits like Forrest Gump and Titanic before she was fired. She's been on the Board of Regents since 1999. Now the conference organizers suggested we present our material with a light touch, yet give the audience members a sense of the controversy so they'd want to read the entire uh, report. It's in that spirit, and soon after the recent Oscars, that I begin by recalling a hilarious 1967 film, a naughty but sophisticated sex farce called A Guide for the Married Man. In the film, Walter Matthau stars as a desperate husband with a roving eye who's ready to take the plunge into an adulterous affair. Robert Morse co-stars as his philandering friend who's become his coach. In a memorable scene, one of Morse's lessons is acted out by Joey Bishop as a husband caught in bed with a voluptuous, much younger woman when his dowdy wife suddenly enters the bedroom, screaming hysterically at what she's witnessed. Without saying a word, Bishop and his paramour make up the bed, matter-of-factly get dressed in silence, she leaves the room, and when Bishop is neatly dressed in a coat and tie, he casually turns to his enraged, shrieking wife and calmly asks her, so what's the matter? The lesson that Morse teaches Matt Dow from that episode is that you, if you are ever caught red-handed in the act, you must deny, deny, deny. Which brings me back to Sherry Lansing, President Udoff, and the UC Board of Regents and our report. Many years ago, the distinguished Southern historian and NAS member C. Van Woodward remarked, the purpose of a university is not to make its members feel secure, content, or good about themselves, but to provide a forum for the new, the provocative, the disturbing, the unorthodox, even the shocking, a place where the unthinkable can be thought, the unmentionable can be discussed, and the unchallengeable can be challenged. Our report showed how far the world's finest public university had drifted from that idealism. We enumerated the en enormous imbalance in political affiliation among UC faculty, especially associate professors 20 to 1 and new hires 30 to 1 Democrats to Republicans, and pinpointed how classroom space, time, and taxpayer money was used for political advocacy causes and social engineering schemes. We documented the pervasive nature of this trend typified by activist zeal and through course descriptions on critical race studies, women's and ethnic studies, social work and social justice, race, class, equity, and the environment, and even computer science, comparative sociology, molecular and cell biology, and many others, all of which incorporated political activism into the class objectives where political harangues were part of the curriculum including, uh, including our very fa favorite, Communication 165 at UCLA, Agitational Communication. We cited departmental mission statements, quoted student complaints, and distinguished between freedom of speech and academic freedom. Neither the academic senate nor the administration would answer our questions. 
Instead, they dismissed our findings in a remarkable display of evasion, prevarication, and lies. Deny, deny, deny. The report primarily asked the regents to investigate some faculty members' obsession with using their classroom for political indoctrination and consciousness raising. We requested a chance to discuss our findings at a regents' meeting. That was 11 months ago. We reminded the regents that the state constitution expressly gave them ultimate responsibility and duty to ensure that the university was not used for political purposes. Unable to perform that duty, the regents outsourced the work to the very people they were supposed to be watching, President Udoff and the Academic Senate. Lansing finally conceded to us a few weeks ago that there was nothing more she could do and insisted she had to defer to the Academic Senate. Exactly five days had separated the regents' receipt of our last three-page letter, February 5th, and Lansing's one-paragraph plaintiff response to us, hardly enough time for the entire board to read, consider, and deliberate, then draft and adopt a common position. Lansing had acted unilaterally on behalf of all the regents. As John and I composed our um, TART response to Lansing last week, uh, just before the Oscars, my first draft of the letter included this paragraph to Sherry Lansing. Your flippant reply could not possibly have allowed time for serious consideration of the issues we raised. You dismissed a serious communication with a trite non-reply that lacked mature reflection. Is that how things were done at Paramount Pictures? <laughs> Mercifully, John Ellis kind of toned that down. But the fundamental issue about classroom politicization that we presented to the regents concerned precisely the refusal to address that question on the part of President Udolf and the Academic Senate. The public deserves more from its designated watchdog than a tiresome pattern of obfuscation and denials. The regents are responsible for upholding the integrity and maintaining the reputation of the University of California. We gave them compelling evidence of public anxieties and serious concerns about classroom politics. Rather than engage us on the issue, the regents led by Sherry Lansing relinquished their responsibility. Peter Berkowitz gave our report prominent coverage in the Wall Street Journal. Deborah Saunders wrote about it in the San Francisco Chronicle. Ellis and I published op-eds in the two largest circulation newspapers in California and Berkowitz did an update 10 days ago in Real, Cl Real Clear Politics, where he concluded, it appears that the UC Board of Regents, in defiance of its legal obligations, is determined to disregard substantial evidence of the politicization of college education. By denying its critics who made their case in the name of disinterested scholarship and liberty of thought and discussion in the classroom, a fair hearing. So, to wrap things up, I happened to be in Washington when the report came out last April. When I returned to Chico, I was astonished to learn that President Udolph himself would actually be in Chico, of all places, a few days later at a Chamber of Commerce function. He was touring Northern California drumming up support for Proposition 30, a Jerry Brown conceived measure that would impose another sales tax hike and increase state taxes on people earning over $250,000. Udolf and his entourage did not expect me there. After giving a boilerplate talk called Dispelling Ten Myths About the University of California, he was confronted by two unfriendly questioners, both parents of UC students. Udolf assured them that, quote, professors are there to educate, not to rouse the troops for a cause, unquote. He admitted that political advocacy by the faculty aggravated him. Then it was my turn. I congratulated Udolf for deploring the problem of classroom politicization. I asked him, quote, why don't you send a memo to all campus chancellors reminding them to condemn inappropriate political advocacy, unquote. Udolf replied meekly, I could do that, but I don't know that it would do much good. What he meant was he would never touch that hornet's nest. Many letters were subsequently exchanged between Udolf and us over the next eight months. John and I grew exasperated and weary, but we tried to remain tenacious. 
We concluded our November 21st letter, kind of a Thanksgiving missive, if you will. We concluded our November 21st letter to Udolf as follows, quote, the destructive influence of radical politics is a clear and growing danger to the university's quality and to its public reputation. Your persistent event tells us that you know this. Determined, courageous leadership is needed if the university's decline is to be arrested and reversed and public confidence regained. It is now abundantly clear that you lack the courage needed for that task. If you do not have the stomach for the job, we suggest you resign and make way for someone who does." Unquote. Eight weeks later, on January 18th, Udolph announced his resignation, <laughs> citing a series of unspecified health challenges. In sum, the collection of letters, all of which are online at the NAS website, demonstrated that the Regents' oversight of UC on behalf of the California public had collapsed. The outgoing president had enabled Lansing to participate in his own pattern of alibis, ruses, and refusal to respond to legitimate questions. Together, they stymied serious discussion with the board as a whole. It left us wondering, what's the point of even having the Board of Regents? In our view, Sherry Lansing betrayed the public's trust, brought shame upon herself, and tarnished the prestigious office she is privileged to hold. The Regents continue giving us excuses and doing nothing. The only thing that may stop them is a fear that too many people may be watching. Udolf probably would have ignored the NAS report except for the interest that Berkowitz's article created in the Wall Street Journal. Given UC's prominence as America's premier system of public education, higher education, what happens there matters for the future of politicized higher education. If the UC regents were ever in any way to admit there was a problem to be addressed, who knows where that might lead? Once the radical fiefdom at UC began to unravel, it's impossible to know how far that process might go. Jacob Bernofsky coined the term habit of truth as the foundational ethic of science. A scientist himself, he argued that the practice of science was in part a moral activity based on the habit of telling the truth. Bernofsky insisted that for science to be truthful, it wasn't enough just to aim at the truth as the ultimate outcome of one's work. Scientists had to be habitually truthful in the minute particulars of their scientific lives. Preparing for this talk, I reread the letters between us and Mark Udolf and Sherry Lansing. I was appalled at how easily they evaded our questions, refused to answer, or simply declared the exchange over. Just like Joey Bishop in the 1967 film, they simply deny, deny, deny. If you ask them uncomfortable questions about their obsession with race, gender, and ethnicity in undergrad admissions or faculty hires, their first inclination is simply not to tell the truth. You'd often the regents never tried to be straight with us. They concealed matters with cliches, quips, and mindless hype. It's scary to notice the speed with which they reached for anything to say except to tell the truth. The gap that exists between them and the wisdom of C. Van Woodward and Jacob Bronofsky is enormous. Modern academic administrators advocate an instrumental orientation designed to achieve an illiberal form of behavior modification among students, as we've heard. They depend on formulaic speech and conduct codes mission statements, and ethics committees to regulate campus behavior. Their heavy reliance on process and procedures betrays an absence of trust even among themselves. A glaring weakness of academic governance was seen in the failure of the Board of Regents to make an honest effort at independent judgment or control and to defer instead to whatever campus chancellors or medio mediocre bureaucratic careerists told them. California has the worst state credit rating in the United States, thanks to chronic overspending, massive state debt, and powerful reform-resisting unions that prompted Charlotte Allen to label California, quote, the American Greece, unquote. Democrats hold every single statewide office, and education policy at all levels is completely dictated and determined by the Democratic Party. Academic bureaucracies loathe criticism and despise negative publicity. 
it is futile to expect Lansing ever to investigate the matter of classroom politicization. This is at the heart of what divides the old school academics like the NAS from the Hollywood Sherry Lansings of academic government, governance. When it comes to the objective reality of classroom politicization, Sherry wants it disguised, kept quiet, or simply ignored, or better yet, encouraged. Universities claim they teach the students how to reason and argue. That process surely occurs in many sectors of American campuses. But our experience, research, and the findings of many others suggest that too often, faculty in the modern academy have created Potemkin villages where behind a facade of pseudo knowledge, they show students how to perform imperative incantations, celebrate diversity, embrace tolerance, practice sustainability, get a degree. It was Dale Carnegie who warned, quote, fear not those who argue, but those who dodge. Thank you very much. <laughs>